let's see, we're in our um, session uh, involving um, mathematics and the uh, uses of data through case studies and uh, wet labs. These are two colleagues who uh, did work uh, closely together geographically, and uh, now they work and continue their friendship, but they're going to share with us their uh, work. And I turn it over to Anne and Rebecca. Hey. Well, thank you, Brian, so much. This, this is Anne Walter. I'm a biologist. I teach in a biology department uh, and have been working closely with Becky and now other um, biomathematicians to teach a modeling course. And I'm Rebecca Sand. I'm at UNC Asheville, um, enjoying working with Anne and now doing versions of what we did now at UNCA. Think next slide, Becky. <laughs> Great. So we had a lot of fun first teaching a course and then putting together this book, which um, allowed us to bring together lab work. You can see some happy students in the lab and mathematical modeling. One of the things I've been really um, impressed with at this conference has been the depth, the extensiveness of models that I've seen. I've seen some just amazing, um, wonderful biological models. I've also seen examples with people using different equations, um, but I've also been impressed with how many people have said that it's either hard to get data or it is hard to help students understand the actual system itself. And quite honestly, that's what we've been trying to do um, through the activities in this book and in the way we've been teaching um, now our separate but respective courses. And like everyone with modeling, you've got to describe the system in detail, come up with a model, test and validate it, assess and revisit. So we have learned that there are some issues and perhaps on the next slide, We'll talk about some of these. Um, today, we're actually not going to share a wet lab, but I'll be really happy to talk about that. But some of the challenges that we have run into is helping students. And I, I should say that our student population is a mix of, at St. Olaf, it's a mix of biology majors and math majors, a few who are doing both. It's mostly sophomores and juniors. Some students will have had differential equations, but many won't. So just a little idea of who we're working with. So getting everyone to articulate the system components and relationships, uh, that's something we work at fairly hard. Identifying units, a ah, huge one. Assumptions, another big one, and I've heard others talk about that in this meeting. Then of course, translating it to mathematical terms, making, adjustments, maybe given the data at hand. So feeling comfortable rather than rigid about the math. Of course, finding the parameter values and making sure that they're reasonable. Coding, coding, that's a big one. Uh, and that we've, we've been solving by finding all kinds of assistance and then assessing the meaning of the results. And particularly with our math students, making sure that they don't just fall apart when they see the model doesn't fit. And you know they are always amazed when I'm jumping down excited when the model doesn't fit um, because it tells us something new. So we're going to use the SIR model. I think everyone has memorized this model and tried it backwards and forwards in the last few years, just to talk a little bit about our strategy, how we introduce the skills, um, the modeling skills that we need. So we do that at the beginning of a chapter. Um, we use our touchstone model, the logistic growth model to introduce numerical solutions to differential equations, parameter estimation by a least squares regression. We work in R by the way, and sensitivity analysis. And of course, after we do that, 
we have students work closely together in the classroom with a very guided example. And we look at, in this case, virus infection in cell culture. And then we revisit similar problems in a case study for in-depth exploration. And we have we offer three different case studies, but the SIR model is right now the most popular one. Becky. So demonstrating, articulating the problem before we develop equations. And this is from our virus infection, the very the, the idea that we take the students step by step. Uh, we give them this diagram, the idea that you want to envision what the heck is happening um, in the model. So in that case, we're infecting cells, the cells are infected with the virus, the virus goes, the virus comes out, we are able to count the viruses. Uh, so this is just a visual to help us learn to think through a problem. And then we take them through the math. Uh, so we set up the differential equations, we do a model calibration, uh, and all of this is highly guided. Next slide. So once we've done that, we're able to then have our students jump into a, a deeper case study. The one we present is the 2009 influenza pandemic. Um, we will articulate and introduce the model equations, just like we did with the virus. We explore assumptions, explore modifications, play with the model to understand each part, uh, make sure that the math works as well. We have to introduce a new term in order to work with the data we have. We'll explore the whole concept of epidemic threshold, effective reproduction number, identify how public health interventions are modeled. We're not going to go through all these, by the way. And then the students are asked to model uh, the influenza as it happened in Australia in 2009, model the first wave, project the second wave, and propose realistic and effective intervention strategies. The next slide. So we want the students to envision the system, draw a picture, what's going on? There's a population, one person is sick. What will happen next? What determines how fast it will happen? And then what happens after more people are infected? Thanks, Anne. So as Anne said, we spent a lot of time having students develop the model. So first, thinking about the key populations, these are our variables in the model. How do individuals move among these, these populations? So they always start by drawing a diagram, labeling the arrows, um, and then thinking about how do, we, how do we formulate those arrows into mathematical expressions. So at this time, students have really developed a modeling toolkit. So we've talked about mass action and first order rates, and we talk about how to model these, um, these arrows using, using those types of expressions. And we spent a lot of time thinking about the assumptions of the model. And from there, then students are able to write the equations down. And when they do this, they have some parameters that come out. Um, here we have B and K. And so we just, again, like Anne mentioned, really step by step, think about with these parameters, what are the units? How does this help us with the interpretation? And then the hard question is how do we obtain values of these parameters? And so this is where we you know, connect it to the data. What data do we need to figure out what these parameters are? Now, before we jump into the, the data and the, the application of the model, we really want students to understand the model. So we have them explore it to help them lead to understanding. And so for, for this example, for the SIR model, we wanna make sure that they can solve it numerically. So we give them parameter values and we make sure they can produce an output and then think about their solution. For this example, what do those parameter values mean? Does the, the, the peak and where the peak occurs, does that seem reasonable? Does the length of the outbreak seem reasonable if we're talking about a flu outbreak? 
And then they play with the model. And so before they do that, though, we always want them to think about these questions, like how would I change as parameters vary? And then they simulate the model. And they do the same thing here. Here's an example showing um, different values of the recovery rate, but they, they do the same thing for the transmission rate constant as well. So really just um, guided that Ebola virus example, we guide them even more. They're, um, this is a little more open-ended, but again, still just guided step-by-step step so it's not overwhelming, especially the coding. Um, we really wanna do piece by piece. They, they can continue exploring. So in the previous question, it was just varying one parameter, but now what if you vary both parameters? How do you visualize this? And so we can produce a plot like this, varying recovery rate and transmission constant and look at the fraction infected throughout the outbreak. And then this leads to more questions. You can see, it seems like there's a threshold. And so students observe that and we see this this threshold for an epidemic to occur. And this just naturally leads into a discussion of basic reproduction number and effective reproduction number. So this gives a goal, right, for public health interventions and it naturally leads into those questions. So for a flu, flu outbreak, what do we, what tools do we have? We have vaccines, antivirals, self-isolation, public health campaigns, encourage hand washing, face masks. And so the students think about, okay, how do these strategies affect the model parameters? And how do changes in the parameters affect the effective reproduction number to get that below one? And so again, we, we, we think about going to the data and what are, for example, for the vaccine, what are the, what's a reasonable proportion of the population that's vaccinated? What's the efficacy of the, the vaccine? So once they've done this, they've, they've gained some confidence. They really understand the SAR model. They really understand the parameters and how they affect the output. So then they're ready to tackle um, an application here. So we consider the 2009 H1N1 flu, and we look at some data in Australia. And you can see that this is weeks since May 24th of new cases. And at this point, at the end of this first outbreak in Australia, they were already seeing a second peak in places like the US and Canada. And so the goal here was to test public health interventions. Could we prevent a second wave or at least reduce the number of infections? Now the data, we have to be a little careful because the data, it's giving us new cases over time. However, in our model, I refers to the number of people infected on a given day. That is not the same as the data that we observe here. So students have to um, kind of come to that conclusion and think about how, how do we use this model and how do we fit parameters based on the, da the data given. What we can get are cumulative cases. And so we have this term BSI in our model and that's giving us number of cases per day. And so we can just form a new equation, DCDT, and they can solve that alongside with the other equations and get cumulative cases. Now there's a little more complexity into this is that the, uh, um, the actual cases is much higher than the reported cases. And so at this, um, during this time, there was an estimate of the reported, the reporting rate. And so they could use that to get an estimate of actual cases. So the students can use the, the data for cumulative cases, use the model output and estimate the transmission rate constant B and the recovery rate constant K in the model. And as Anne said, we do use R throughout the course and um, we use ModFit, their optimization package to perform this. So once they've, they've modeled this, they have parameter values, then they can start thinking. So we give them a little scenario. They are a modeler at the time, at the end of that first outbreak, the virus is evolving, resulting in higher transmissibility. If we didn't have vaccines, how many people would be infected? 
But at that time, they were developing vaccines and they were going to be ready to come out around October or November. This was such a different um, strain that we had seen before and come out in the summer also. And so our, our vaccines weren't very effective at the time. So they were rolling out new vaccines. They were going to be out that fall. And so the question was, um, if we had this vaccine and researchers estimated the um, vaccine effectiveness to be 56%. The students had to simulate different vaccin vaccination strategies, report their findings, use figures, results, tables um, to inform um, of what these, what these different strategies, what the output would be, how many people would be infected. And then we also give them a chance to brainstorm all kinds of other complexities at the time, you know, what happens you know, school holidays or um, the fact that it was affecting younger people, children, young adults, middle-aged adults, um, that it was affecting them differently than older adults. How would you incorporate that in the model? There are lots of questions they could ask at this point and think about how to modify, modify the model. What kind of data would you need to better understand this? Great. So one of the things we, we also wanted to share was that, of course, we chose the 2009 influenza epidemic because there was tons of data. We had no idea that there was going to be a COVID-19 epidemic. Um, but I think it's in terms of adopting this particular exercise, um, I think all of us know there are data sets available on multiple pandemics, multiple locations. Uh, there's da data sets with complexity, adding a vector, malaria. I think I saw a very nice malaria talk the other day. Or divide the data into cohorts. Um, so we really encourage both our students to do this or just to say that if you were working from the platform we provided, this would be a fairly easy thing for you to do. And of course, the current COVID-19 data are extremely rich, um, very timely. Um, they also need to be handled with some care. Uh, when you're in the middle of a pandemic, there are all kinds of reasons to be cautious. Uh, it's also to be cautious with your students. Your students have had COVID, students have had family with COVID, students are in the midst of thinking about the ethics of vaccines. So um, this is a time to really bring up ethics. This is an opportunity where um, math students, biology students, and you can be thinking about ethical questions as well. Um, I'll also note as a cell biologist that there is a ton of SARS-CoV-2 data, the actual virus data, which is very rich, very timely to be studying now. We also, um, both within the text and in, within the lab pro program of the course, offer all sorts of multi-compartment model systems uh, to, that you could run with once you've kind of gone through this kind of labored exercise. Um, the students, as Becky said, have become much more confident. They've learned to talk to each other, to communicate. They've learned to trust uh, and verify, I would say, uh, if a biology student says something is true or if a math student asserts we can do it this way, the biology students learn to check. So they are confident of each other. The next slide. So, one of the things I would say, having had the privilege of teaching students now for multiple years in this context, is that um, one, one thing we have learned is that clear communication about every step is critical. We shouldn't make any assumptions about what students know. In the room, there'll be one student or 10 students who know what you're saying at a given time but the other half of the students won't have a clue. And so it's really important to be very clear, which also helps achieve the goal of being very clear about the model itself. It enhances everyone's understanding. No one runs off making random assumptions. Um, and also by working together, having different sorts of students raise questions, uh, 
there's it's easier to explore. So if different students are raising different kinds of questions, the teams have become confident together in their skill sets and in sharing their expertise. I, th I think it really provides a way for them, these students, to be launched into a more challenging modeling course or very often into their first dif differential equations course, a course maybe they thought they never wanted to take. I think that's it. So I know we would be, should acknowledge that we had a lot of help pulling all this together. I hope others have had help pulling together their courses as well. And I know we'd be happy to answer questions of, about anything. Um, I guess I, I would ask, how did you get started? The two of you collaborating. Uh, we have to acknowledge our associate dean, uh, Matt Ritchie. Uh, we got started, I, I will say, be, I think Becky must have had this idea. Becky had realized that there was, that math students needed some tangible stuff. And okay. our, our associate dean, Matt Ritchie, uh, introduced us. Ah, okay. Yeah. And I'll just add, I think, you know, the modeling courses I had taken in undergrad and graduate school, there was never a connection to data and not the, you know, the communication across disciplines. And so when I got to St. Olaf, there was already a group of faculty really interested in trying to build the bridges between the, the departments. They had a um, the biomass seminar going where different faculty would come in from different departments and talk about you know, math bio related things. And um, so they had already done a lot, but they, we had decided to start a math bio concentration at St. Olaf. It's like an interdisciplinary minor. And we really wanted just like a, a core course for that concentration that was really collaborative, you know, students from both disciplines in the room together. So that was really the momentum to get this okay. going. And as Anne said, the Dean was really supportive. So we were very lucky. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it sounds like usually it's uh, you, you, you have a lunchroom buddy or somebody, you know, you, you meet socially, but your Dean actually facilitated that. that that's remarkable. I think he's, he's a good Dean, I think. It is a good dean, and, and I th what Becky said was true. We have been struggling for the longest time, uh, also with that the language barrier between disciplines. Mm -hmm. We had we had um, fairly successfully worked on the language barrier between chemistry and biology. And earlier in the room, I heard a student doing PCHEM with her math, and we you know we had been working on that language barrier, and. Uh, the, the barrier between math and biology is, is real, uh, very different approaches, but uh, there was a lot of goodwill. Um, and I, I can say that things have, things have continued. We have actually adopted R in the biology department as opposed to using Excel as our way of doing things. We have uh, R star tutors, the R stars are tutoring. Uh, they're also training the biology faculty to uh, make assignments that take advantage of the tools of our. So that's one of the sort of follow alongs from uh, having accomplished both the concentration now very well established and this course. That's great that you get science faculty to engage in the same software that uh, some of the math faculty are doing, you know, that that's a language that's common right there. So, mm -hmm. um, well, uh, I want to thank you very much, and I wish you both well separately and together. Uh, I hope you hear from people using the materials. I have a copy of that book, and I'm if I was back in a faculty uh, in the liberal arts college, Albion College, where I used to teach, I know exactly who I would go to in the biology department, and I would say, hey, let's get together and do this, plus because I don't know anything about Petri dishes and labs and collecting data and you do. And maybe I can help you with some analysis of your data on your research or something to get them to buy in. And could we teach this as a seminar first time around? And, um, mm -hmm. it, it has a rich scaffolding support your text. And I really admire you for doing that. Thank you very much. This is how we say thank you. Okay. <laughs>